Imagine you are sitting right where you are and looking through this window 150 years ago. What would you see? <coughs> Not quite, but you're about to find out that this property does have a secret story to tell. There are many places around us with secret stories. You may have seen some of these places yourself. Their stories are connected to people who came here from distant lands. Why did they come all this way to Bean Lee? For everyone that made that long journey, there is a story to tell. A few of those stories are told here. Queensland was born by royal decree on the 6th of June 1859. After celebrating in grand style, the new government faced the task of finding funds for roads, bridges, shipping facilities and hospitals. To this end, the government was keen to develop Queensland's agricultural industries. Two industries in particular stood out as having great potential, cotton and sugar. The Queensland climate suited these crops and the European demand for cotton and sugar was high. In 1863, Captain Lewis Hope had successfully grown sugar cane in the Brisbane region, proving its commercial viability. The government decided that Queensland's cotton or sugar would be grown initially in the region known as Moreton Bay. At that time, this was an area that stretched across the southeast corner of the new colony. Everything was in place, the land, the climate and the vision. What they didn't have was the people to make it all a reality. In the northeast of what is now known as Germany, there lies a small village known as Stegelitz. This was the much-loved home of the Kleinschmidt family. It was here about 150 years ago that Karl Friedrich Kleinschmidt worked as a carpenter and sold fruit from his orchards to supplement his meagre income. Although Karl Friedrich worked hard, there was very little money to be made and the prospects for his family were bleak. The Kleinschmidt family were not alone in their struggle to make a living. Millions of rural workers across Europe were in a similar position. The Industrial Revolution had brought sweeping changes and steam-driven farm machines were now doing the work of many labourers. Added to this, for generations farms had been passed down to sons and divided amongst them. The reduced size of farms meant many properties were no longer viable. For the European working class, the effect was devastating. They found themselves either unemployed or living on subsistence earnings. For them, their choices were very limited. They could either stay home and starve or throw in their lot and emigrate to lands unknown. In these bleak times, many European families, like the Kleinschmidts, were now looking hard at their options for a better future. Among them was Karl Heinrich Heck, a miller, who lived with his family in the town of Pretzlau. To the west, across the English Channel, in a Devonshire village, John Davy and Francis Gooding were also considering their future. Back in Queensland, the Reverend John Dunmore Lang, a leader of the Presbyterian Church in Brisbane, had become obsessed with his vision for Queensland's future prosperity. Key to this vision was the immigration of workers from Europe. Lang wrote books on the subject and visited Britain and Germany where he lectured officials and made appeals to workers. Before long, the word about Queensland went out into the villages and farmlands of Europe. In the early to mid-1860s, the Kleinschmidts, the Heck family, Francis Gooding and John Davy all put their names down for passage to Queensland. Numerous others joined them on packed immigrant ships bound for Moreton Bay. These were long and perilous journeys, where onboard deaths and births were common. Their destination was the fertile lands around the Albert and Logan Rivers. After months of idleness on the sea, the settlers arrived with a keen desire to begin building their new life. Properties were selected and the arduous task of clearing began. 
the Kleinschmidt family cleared their property of 18 acres on the Logan River. The Heck family selected a property at Alberton, while Davy and Gooding formed a partnership to work their plantation beside the Albert River. Before long, the newcomers were growing beans, corn and potatoes. They certainly had their struggles, but the land and the future was theirs. Their dreams were coming true. With encouragement from the government, the farmers began growing crops of cotton. Although they met with some success in growing the cotton, the industry itself failed to prosper. Natural pests and a lack of skills and labour all took their toll. From the mid-1860s, farmers increasingly turned their attention to sugar. And in this, they were not disappointed. All around the Albert and Logan rivers, fields of sugarcane were soon thriving under the generous Queensland sun. The partnership of Francis Gooding and John Davy was one of the early sugar success stories. In 1865, they established one of the region's first plantations. They named their plantation Bean Lee, after the family estate Davy had left behind in Devonshire, England. They later built their own cane crushing mill on their property. If you were sitting here on this spot almost 150 years ago, this is what you would see. Davy and Gooding sugar fields all around you. Spurred on by the early successes of sugar farming, more and more settlers arrived and bought land all up and down the Albert and Logan valleys and lowlands. With the settlers came tradesmen and merchants, some of whom began to congregate around an intersection in the wagon tracks known as the Five Ways. In 1867, when seeking a name for this growing community, they chose Bean Lee in honour of Davy and Gooding's plantation. Of those who helped develop the early town, James Savage, who ran the general store, is remembered as an outstanding community leader. The years between the late 1870s to 1885 are remembered as the boom years for Bean Lee's sugar industry, with up to 40 sugar mills operating in the region. The most enduring of these is the Rocky Point Mill, established by the Heck family. Carl Heinrich Heck established a mill at Rocky Point in 1879. Some years later, his son Wilhelm moved the operation to its present location at Wungulba, although they continued to call it the Rocky Point Mill. Here, the mill has played an enduring and vital role in the local industry. During the sugar industry's boom years, the Logan and Albert rivers were busy with sailing vessels and steamers that brought supplies to the scattered settlements and took away sugar and molasses from the farms. Perhaps the most famous, or infamous, of vessels on the waterways was the SS Walrus. In the late 1860s, the appearance of sugar plantations along the Albert and Logan rivers raised the issue of milling the sugar cane. Unless the cane was crushed quickly after harvesting, it would spoil in humid weather. In 1869, a man by the name of James Stewart believed a floating mill could be the solution. He purchased the 30 metre SS Walrus and installed on it a crushing mill and a rum distillery. Cruising up and down the river, the Walrus could crush two tonnes of sugar cane a day and in its first year produced 14,000 gallons of rum. However, the authorities withdrew the Walrus's licence in 1872, partly because it was too difficult to track how much rum was actually made and therefore how much tax was due. After the Walrus's licence was withdrawn, it is said that it carried on operations illegally, evading authorities as it drifted up and down local rivers. In 1884, Francis Gooding purchased the still from the Walrus and began producing award-winning Beanley rum beside the Albert River at Eagleby. About 30 years later, Beanley rum passed hands for a time to the Kleinschmidt family. Although the sugar industry enjoyed a prosperous beginning, in 1886 the industry fell on hard times. In that year, a slump in world demand for sugar caused a crippling fall in sugar prices. Then, in 1887, 
Sugar farmers suffered another blow when floods destroyed crops and washed away bridges. The raging Albert River ravaged the Beanley Rum Distillery, washing away the still and a large stock of rum. By the late 1880s, the sugar industry was in deep recession. Many farmers abandoned the industry and moved on to other pursuits. However, the German immigrants were an exception. The German families had formed close communities with strong religious, social and cultural ties. They supported each other in hard times and grew mixed crops when sugar prices were low. It's not surprising then that the survivors of the sugar recession included the Kleinschmidt and Heck families, along with many of their compatriots. In the early 1900s, the sugar industry picked up again, but never to the same level that it was in the 1880s. Many farmers had turned their attention to other activities, such as beef and dairy farming, which became highly important to the region. However, the sugar fields continued to grow in the Albert and Logan lowlands, and rum is still produced beside the Albert River. Rising above the cane fields, the Rocky Point sugar mill remains in the hands of the Heck family and is now the district's only surviving mill. Today, across these hills and valleys and beyond, the descendants of the settlers of the sugar fields are many. In this, the dreams of those adventurous settlers have been realised. As for the settlers themselves, they are now laid in the soil in which they laboured. Their headstones bear silent witness to those who pinned their hopes on this land and brought the sugar fields to life.